only mode. Welcome. Thank you for joining the After School series um, of webinars. Funding for today's webinar was provided to the Iowa Department of Public Health through a HRSA TBI implementation grant. The webinar is being recorded and will be archived for later viewing. During the session, if you have a question, go ahead and enter them in the questions box. And during natural breaks in the, in the presentation, we'll get to your question. Following the session, we ask that you complete a survey that will pop up when you exit the webinar. By completing the evaluation, you will receive a certificate of, of attendance, and that will go out by email tomorrow. Today's session is returning to the classroom following concussion. Our speaker today is Leslie Dunnick. Leslie joined the Central College staff as an athletic assistant athletic trainer in 1998. She was named the head athletic trainer in 2003. In the fall of 2011, she moved into a more academic role as an associate professor of exercise science and continued to serve as an assistant athletic trainer with the athletic programs at Central College. Sorry, stuttering today. Um, she was appointed a class dean beginning in the spring of 2012 and currently works with the class of 2017 along with her academic duties. A native of Monroe, Iowa, Dunnick is a 1990 Central graduate and a certified athletic trainer. She received a master's degree in physical education with an athletic training emphasis from Indiana State University. From 1994 to 98, she worked with an orthopedist office in a sports medicine outreach program at a hospital in Terre Haute, uh, Indiana. In 2010, Dunnick received the Iowa Athletic Trainers Society College Athletic Trainer of the Year Award. In 2002, she received a Central Presidential Service Standards Award for her work at the college. She has served as a term. She has served a term as Public Relations Director for IATC, and she has spent one year as a member of the Iowa Board of Chiropractic. Welcome, Leslie, and thank you for being our presenter today. Well, thank you. Um, Good afternoon, everyone that's joining us on the webinar today. Um, so today we're going to be talking about returning to the classroom following a concussion. And the topics we're going, um, I will start with my disclaimers. I don't have anything to disclose. Um, uh, I'm not a physician. I'm an athletic trainer with a passion for the issue of concussions. This is one of the things I spend a lot of time reading about every day. And um, this presentation is a compilation of the most recent research that I could find and the best practices related to returning students to the concussion, uh, classroom after concussion. Um, it's not an area that I have the ability to do research in, but it's one that I read voraciously about. So I feel very comfortable um, having these sorts of conversations with folks. Today we're going to talk about basic symptoms noticed in the classroom following a concussion, signs that a student may need to go back to the doctor, the time frame that their symptoms will last, the importance of following a doctor's orders and being in communication with a doctor's office, the importance of parental involvement and rest at home, um, the adjustments and accommodations that teachers might use in the classroom, and then resources. And I believe that Maggie has emailed out um, the resources that I provided. There were four different pieces of information. Um, one of them was actually a list of resources and links that would be helpful. Um, so hopefully you will find those to be useful as we move forward, um, as you move forward after today's presentation. So first of all, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about just the definition of a concussion and what those symptoms might look like. Um, so a concussion is defined as a type of traumatic brain injury, or TBI, that results from a bump, blow, jolt to the head, or a hit to the body that causes the brain to shake around in the skull. And the best example that I can give of this is if you take an egg and shake it. You can't see what's going on on the inside of the egg while you shake the egg. However, if you open up the egg, you can sometimes see the damage that was done by physically shaking the egg. When this occurs in the brain, it actually damages brain cells and causes a cascade of chemical changes to occur in the brain that they're still researching to try to understand. Um, it's really important to know that you don't have to lose consciousness to have a concussion. You don't have to hit your head to sustain a concussion. Um, someone can fall really hard on their bottom and get a concussion. So it's, um, 
it can be one of those things that's very elusive to figure out. Um, one of the other things that's really important to note is most of these kids look normal. They don't look like they have a problem. In the first couple days, they may have a dazed and confused look about them, and if you know them well, you can see that in their eyes or in their face, but you're not always going to notice that. The absolute best treatment for concussion they're finding is rest and sleep. Um, in fact, um, research is starting to show us that waking them up at night to check on them is actually counterproductive because that's when they get their best healing time is actually when they're resting or sleeping. Um, the other thing that it's a misnomer um, for people is that you have to have a CT scan or an MRI to diagnose a concussion, which is not, not true. Um, this, a concussion is a functional injury of the brain. It's not a structural injury to the brain. So most CT scans and MRIs are going to be normal. Um, just because that MRI is normal doesn't mean they don't have a concussion, though. So it can be something that throws people off. Um, it's important to know that those tests are important for um, people who are having other symptoms. For example, if they're getting progressively worse in the first 48 to 72 hours, so a good example is if they have a really good period of time, six, seven hours, and then all of a sudden um, they get a really nasty headache or they lose consciousness or they become really lethargic or a stumble and fall, things that are abnormal, so they were doing really well, and all of a sudden they've kind of gone um, backwards, that's a, that's a really good indication that they need to go back to the doctor and potentially need to have an MRI done, and then that's when the doctor would play a role there. So it's really important to make sure that if they do have um, regression in their symptoms, that they go back to the doctor. And then they need to rule out other serious problems. So that's really what a concussion is. What are those symptoms? So this is a... Um, uh, a chart that I borrowed from uh, the benefits of good concussion management um, out of the Rocky Mountain Children's Hospital out of Colorado. And it gives us the physical, cognitive, emotional symptoms that you typically need. Sleep is also there as well, but you really can't use sleep in the first initial diagnosis of a concussion. Um, so physically, the person is going to have a headache, which is the hallmark sign of a concussion, among others, blurred vision, dizzy. Uh, ringing in their ears, they see stars, they just look like they're not all there, so that vacant, blank look about their face. And then sensitivity to light, noise, those are the kinds of things that you're typically going to see physically. There's other symptoms listed there that make sense. Nausea and vomiting are common as well. However, I would contend that if a person has a concussion and they, they vomit once, they're probably actually going to feel better. If they continue to vomit or vomit after during that 48 to 72 hour window, then that's probably a sign that there's something else going on, so you need to be aware of that. Cognitively, they just feel like um, there's a cloud or a fog over their brain that things aren't really clear like they should be. They don't remember things well. They get distracted really easy. Um, they get confused. So those are the kinds of things their thinking isn't very clear. Um, and that can mag um, that can show itself in a number of different ways depending on the age of the student that you're working with or the child that you're working with or person. Emotionally, they may have emotions inappropriate for the situation that they're in. They'll be laughing hysterically at something that's not funny or they'll be very angry for a reason that is really unidentifiable, so they'll have inappropriate emotions. They may be different or they may act different, so their personality might be different. Um, they may be really irritable. They may be the happy-go-lucky kid normally, and all of a sudden they're very irritable. Um, or they might be really sad, so it's important to note the changes to your student. Um, and then sleep and energy, this happens after the fact, so you know they have that initial injury, they've been diagnosed. All of a sudden they may start having trouble sleeping. They may... Um, not be able to sleep. They may be sleeping more than normal. They might not be able to go to sleep. So it's important to be aware of that also. Um, one of the other things that we're going to talk a little bit about, and it's also further into the presentation, is something that's um, been coined the Monday morning concussion. So you have this young person who gets injured in an evening game, maybe on a Friday night, um, basketball game, for example, since we're in basketball season. And um, they go home and they have a headache initially, but 
you know they have a pretty good evening, they sleep well, the next morning it's pretty low key, there's not a lot going on at home, um, so they have a really quiet week weekend and it goes really well and all of a sudden on Monday morning you send them to school and their symptoms just manifest themselves with a vengeance. Not, that's something that they're diagnosing or coining the Monday morning concussion and that's not all that unusual. In my role as an athletic trainer, I've seen that a number of times um, as I've worked with young men and women that have had concussions at the college level. Um, so they don't always get their symptoms right away, so it's really important that we acknowledge that. Symptoms are the way of the body, the body's way of telling us that it needs more rest, both physical and cognitive, and we're going to spend most of our time talking about cognitive rest today. Um, the brain doesn't work like it's supposed to after a concussion because of all those chemical things that are going on. And the good news here is that at one to three weeks, they're going to probably be back to normal. Most students will be. But doing too much too soon can actually delay the process. So my favorite is the student who gets the concussion on Monday night's JV football game, and then they play video games um, the next day, and they don't understand when their symptoms are worse. Well, it's because of the video game. So that's just one example. Um, so it's really important that we honor the symptoms that the body is providing us. Um, so if we listen, our body tells us a lot of things. So one of the really important hallmarks and things we're going to talk about as we go through here is that what brings on symptoms and what is the time frame that brings on symptoms. So if it takes about 30 minutes to bring on symptoms while you're reading, it's a way for you to know that you did too much and you probably need to back off the next time. So we know recovery from most concussions is pretty predictable. Again, that one to three week time period. Time period. And um, over that period of time, we're going to gradually increase their cognitive level of activity. So home and social activities will be the first things that we're going to add back in. Physical activity actually is the last thing that gets added, and that has to be done with medical clearance. And we will talk a little bit about that more here in a little while. So when you're in the classroom or you're at school, what, what should you look for? Now this comes from um, the CDC returning to school after concussion document. Um, and what's really critical here as you read through this list, most of those things are going to make perfect sense, but it's knowing your child or your student that's most important. So you need a baseline behavior. Okay? So if you, you're new to this um, school or it's the beginning of a new year and you've never met this child before, you need to consult with a previous teacher or you need to talk to somebody who knows the, the child better if they've had the same primary care doctor all the way through, their primary care doctor may be able to help you um, understand what's normal behavior or baseline behavior for this particular child. So that's really important and it's kind of a key to letting you know how they're feeling um, and to know whether or not they're being honest with you. So in my role dealing with college students, college students want to continue playing their sport. So they like to lie and they don't do it maliciously, they do it because they want to be able to participate. So. Um, those are the kinds of things we have to look for. But as you look at the list of um, things to look for in the classroom, they're very similar to the list that I provided earlier of that symptoms of a concussion. Um, so they don't deal with stress well. They're emotional. Um, they may uh, burst out or have an act out situation, especially at the elementary level, that's inappropriate for the situation they're in. And it simply may be because they're symptomatic or they're, they're just too fatigued in order to keep their brain functioning at a level that it needs to be at. And we'll talk about some strategies to deal with that as we go forward. One of the things you're going to see is they have trouble remembering things or learning new information. And they might need longer time um, to complete tasks or they might need more time to shift between tasks. So those are the kinds of behaviors you're going to see. And again, if you're seeing impulsive behavior in a student that that's not normal for, it's critical that you don't just dismiss it as they're having a bad day. It may simply be that they're having trouble with their concussion, especially if you are aware that they have that diagnosis. So um, the problem is, again, there's no outward appearance that the student or the child has a problem, but their symptoms continue to persist. So a lot of times people dismiss them as just acting out rather than the fact that they truly do have a problem. So it's, it's important to take that into note. The other thing to be aware of is that stimulating environments, so light, even if it's ambient light um, coming in from the windows, so it's a bright, it was a bright sunny day uh, here today, and that 
sun shining in the window can actually cause problems for a student that has a concussion, or the noise in the hallway. So what is passing class like in your average high school? Um, pretty noisy. So that, that might be something that needs to be accommodated. Um, and we'll talk about some ways to do that as well uh, as we go through here today. Oh, so length of recovery, I've already alluded to this, but it's really important to note that 80 to 90 percent of all concussions, mild concussions, okay, sport-related concussions, so we're not talking about motor vehicle trauma here, so that, I want to be very clear there, um, but those concussions usually resolve in one to three weeks, um, so that's that's been documented over and over again through a number of different studies. I've happened to reference a study done by Collins et al. here. Um, and it is also research documented that it may take longer for kids and adolescents. So children and adolescents may take longer to get better. And that they think they're positing that is related to the fact that their brain is still developing. Um, so the other issue to be aware of is if they have a history of headaches, depression, ADD, or a prior concussion or family history of migraine, it actually may take them longer to get better. And one of the early, um, some early research that's being done on dizziness as a symptom, so they've been looking at symptoms um, presented upon initial concussion presentation. So if they have the symptom of dizziness, um, they're starting to see that dizziness can be a predictor of a longer recovery period. So if they presented with an initial symptom list and it included dizziness, it may be something that takes them a little bit longer to get better from. So being aware of what the symptoms are, um, is, per, is key, as well as monitoring what their symptoms are. And monitoring their symptoms includes not only what their symptoms are, but what triggered those symptoms. So is it the smart board in the classroom because of the fact that things are moving? Or was it band class because it was too loud? Or is it just math that bothers them? And I know that sounds um, questionable, but I can tell you from personal experience working with students at the college level that there will be just one or two things that cause their symptoms, especially after the fact. And I worked with a young man not long ago who was still having symptoms of concussion a year later, and the only thing he had trouble with was doing high-level math. And he, math was always something that was very easy for him, but um, he was a case of a young man who had concussion number four. And now, all of a sudden, math was something that he struggled to understand. Everything else still worked like it was supposed to. So it can manifest itself in many different ways. Um, so those are the symptoms, what to look for in the classroom, and general recovery. So we're going to talk about um, how to deal with the usual um, patient as well as the patients that fall outside that. So I do want to take time at, right now to see if there's any questions related to symptomology. Yes, we did have a question come in, um, and people can enter in questions right now as well. Um, are unequal pupils a symptom of TBI? They can be. However, do they have unequal pupils normally becomes the question. So that is actually, that actually can be normal in some people. So concussion, that would be what we call a um, cranial that's a cranial nerve problem when we have unequal pupils. And that would be something that as a clinician, would, if I didn't know that was normal for that person, that would be something that would trigger me to send them to the emergency room, is unequal pupils. And that's all the questions we have at this time. OK. So um, we'll keep moving forward here. So the next um, bit of information I'm going to provide you is um, teams involved in dealing with students, getting them back to the classroom. And this is work done by Mark Halstead, who is a physician, and Karen McAvoy out of Colorado. Um, they're, they're key in this concept of this team approach. I would consider them the leaders in the field of returning students to the classroom. And they published an article in November of 2013 called Returning to learning following a concussion, and it was published in the American Academy of Pediatrics, and it is listed on your resources and links um, page, I believe, and it is also, um, the reference for it is at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, it's important to note that there's not a lot of research that's really been done in this area. However, this information that I'm providing today is based on expert opinion and use in the field. Um, so 
what, what are people seeing when they're trying to work students back into the classroom. The other thing that's very key here, no matter how we deal with this, is this is always going to be individual and every student's going to progress differently and that, that can be very frustrating because you want to plan and you want to plan to follow. Um, guidelines are the, the best thing that I can um, provide you um, in this regard. So if you understand that there's no exact recipe, there's no cookie cutter, there's no manual that it was going to tell you exactly how to do this, um, that will help you um, in knowing that everybody's an individual we have to move forward. And the example I always like to use for this is I worked with a young woman who was um, not colorblind and she became colorblind after her uh, first concussion and she was colorblind for about a week and um, very odd symptom. It manifested itself in a really interesting way um, and she didn't realize that she was colorblind until she didn't know which light on the stoplight was red because she never learned that the red light is at the top and the green light is at the bottom. So um, it's interesting how those things come forward. Now this next slide I'm going to show you is very busy and I will acknowledge that it's very busy, but this is off of the homepage for the um, Rocky Mountain Center for Sports Medicine out of Colorado. So this is where the REAP concussion management program comes from and I have provided you in the um, handouts that Maggie sent your way their um, concussion protocol or manual. Um, it's a long document, but it's a fabulous document, and it, it really describes this team approach very well. And REAP stands for Remove and Reduce, Educate, Adjust and Accommodate, and Pace. And this is how you can get your students back to the classroom. And there are four teams involved here, and those teams are the family team, the school physical team, the school academic team, and that should say medical team just once, so I apologize for that typographical error. The important thing for each one of these is every one of these teams should have a point person, and that point person is the one that communicates with the other members of the team. This allows for a smooth communication, so whether that's mom and the nurse at the doctor's office and the athletic trainer or the gym teacher at the school and the nurse at the school or the um, teacher, the classroom teacher, that's, um, that ensures the communication for the well-being of the student is being taken into consideration. So what these four teams look like um, are right here. So we'll start with the family team. So this is the student, the parents, and anyone else connected to the daily direct care of that child. So this could include a daycare provider or a grandparent as well as, as a number of other people. Um, in the early phases, the student may not be ready to go back to school. So we need to acknowledge right away that they may just feel bad enough that being at school is not a good place for them. Resting at that point is much, is to their advantage. Um, so as their symptoms become more tolerable, they should be able to start to do more things and that can include um, short-term activities, that could include someone coming to the house for tutoring, I'm not saying that that needs to happen, but it's, 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 it's an option. Um, but those first days, the goal is to maximize their recovery, so this is the reduce and rest portion, so reduce their cognitive and physical activity and rest portion. And I want to go out on record of saying they shouldn't be doing any physical activity at all at this stage of the game. That does require medical clearance from a physician or other qualified healthcare professional. And every state in the country has a concussion legislation and it usually applies only to athletes, but it does, it can be used in application to all students with problems. Um, so there are a number of different ways in every state that that medical clearance can be attained. So if you're not in Iowa, um, I don't know what your law might say, but in Iowa it can be a nurse, an athletic trainer, a physician, nurse practitioner, um, or chiropractor that can um, release a student back to um, activity. The other thing that needs to happen at home is you need to reduce their sensory load. So again, um, no video games, no texting, no computer, um, again, if those cause problems. They might be able to listen to music as long as it's not loud um, or have the TV on and listen to it as long as it doesn't bother them. But for some students, the sheer act of the pictures moving across the screen will actually give them symptoms back. Um, so sometimes just a, a nice um, dark place to rest is a good place to be. Um, so those are things you have to take 
think about, and getting a kid off a cell phone is one of the most difficult things that you'll have to deal with, um, especially if they're older students, um, because they're used to having those in their hands all the time. The other thing is they shouldn't drive until they've been cleared. Um, so lots of rest, sleep, and that's especially critical in the first 48 hours. Um, the student may also be really symptomatic at the doctor's office if you take them for that initial diagnosis, but with several days of rest, they might be really minimally symptomatic. So the parent needs to be the one that decides when the student is ready to go back to school. So when they get to the point where they can handle 30 to 45 minutes of cognitive sorts of activities, they're ready to go back at least part of a day to school. Um, ultimately, that's their decision, um, and it can be made in conjunction with the doctor's office, but the parent is really at the point where they're going to be able to know their student the best and send them back to school when they feel they can at least handle half of a day of school. Um, so the next team is the school physical team. So this is comprised of coaches, certified athletic trainers, physical education teachers, playground supervisors, the school nurse would be involved in this team as well as potentially others depending on the school district that you're in. The primary responsibility of this group at this time is to ensure that they are safeguarded from any potential further brain injury. So if PE is a requirement at your district, you need to excuse them for PE for this particular time frame because they shouldn't be doing anything that raises their heart rate and blood pressure during this academic recovery time because it's only going to delay their recovery rather than assist their recovery. Now it does get to the point in time where if their symptoms are longer than that two to three week period of time or that one to three week period of time that you may want to start to challenge them with some physical activity but it needs to be done in a a medically approved situation, so the doctor needs to be involved in this, and it also needs to be in a way that's safe. So not in a, put them on a stationary bike, for example, would be one way to do that, so that they're not in jeopardy of getting hit in the head with a ball or those kinds of things. So again, that would be done in conjunction with the physician, and it usually wouldn't be done in that first one to three week period of time. Um, when you do return them to activity, it should be a graduated return to activity, and there's lots of examples of returning to play um, paradigms um, available out there, but the one that's been recommended is through the American Academy of Pediatrics, and it's entitled Sport-Related Concussion in Children and Adolescents, and it applies to both athletes and non-athletes. So I will give you an example of what a return to learn and a return to play a paradigm looks like together today as well. So that's the school physical team. So the next two slides are actually related to the school academic team. So this is comprised of the teacher or teachers, depending on the level of the student and the district that they're in, the school counselor, a school psychologist if it's available, this would be the principal or other administrators, and then any others that would be um, related to the academic. So I'll use my daughter's school as an example. She has a music teacher, a PE teacher, an art teacher, her classroom teacher, and a tag teacher. So those teachers would all need to be involved in this. And only one of those teachers would need to be the point person um, for communicating um, to the other teams. So the academic team's job is to coordinate their return to cog cognitive exertion and facilitate any adjustments that need to be done to reduce their, or eliminate their symptoms. Now some of these get, um, some of these are very basic, simple ideas and we'll talk about them more in detail as we move forward. Um, one person coordinates this, but everyone needs to understand the effect of concussion on learning and how to best get students back into the classroom during this recovery period. So we're going to spend most of our time today talking most of the rest of our time today talking about how do we get students back into the classroom and what are those kinds of things we need to think about um, changing in order to let them be successful as they return to the classroom. Um, again, the parent is ultimately the one that decides when the student can return to school. Um, and once the student is back in school, um, the academic team is the one that's responsible for returning them back to the learning environment. They don't need medical clearance in order to return to the classroom. They need medical clearance to return to the practice field or the game field. Um, so it's really important to understand how you break up your day. So most students, when they can get that 30, 45 minutes of activity or stimulation, they can come back for probably half a day of school. And there's a lot of learning that can happen in 30 to 45 minutes, especially if it doesn't cause them to have symptoms. 
So if they start to have symptoms in that time frame after 30 to 45 minutes, then you might need to let them rest. And that may simply be letting them put their head on their desk for five to 10 minutes or sending them to the nurse's office to rest for that five or 10 minutes. The, the bigger issue is the longer they're out of school, the harder it is to make it up. So that's where missing instruction requires other adjustments that just may make it even harder on everybody. So the sooner we can get them back to school, even for part of the day, the better off they're going to be. So for an elementary student, that may be, um, you know, mostly mornings because that's when they do better or a high school student that could be alternating morning to afternoon depending on what classes they have. So my example again is from the college level but we tell students to um, if they only feel like they can go to two of their four classes in a given day they should go to two of those classes on Monday see how they feel Tuesday and if Wednesday they're still kind of feeling where they can only go to two classes they should go to the other two classes so that they're alternating um, what classes they're getting their information from but keeping up in other ways and so communicating with their faculty members becomes important. Okay. So missing is actually harder to catch up with than coming part of the time. You also need to note, it, note which classes make their symptoms worse. So my math example would be a really good one. So is math the only thing that's really bothering them? Or is it um, just um, when you show videos, for example, that they really have their bigger issues? So what is causing their issues? Um, and note the time of day that that is. It could simply be because they're fatigued from the whole day. And if their symptoms come on at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, maybe it's because they just um, maybe just not ready for that. And that will get better every day. So every day should be a little bit better. So the other thing that's really important here is that you should incrementally inc expect them to do more. So again, if it's one, one thing that they're having trouble with, you can make adjustments there, but you know, expect them to start doing everything else fairly normally. So those are the kinds of things you have to think about from, from the academic team side. The fourth the fourth team that we'll talk about here is the medical team. Um, so again, this is the emergency room, if that's where you went, primary care doctor, nurse or other specialists. And typically the nurse is going to be the one communicating with the school. So it's really important for mom and dad or whoever is taking care of the child to um, sign the proper consent forms to allow the doctor's office to speak with the folks at school. Because um, that's the best way to ensure communication um, and everybody is on the same page that way. Again, they have to be removed from all physical activity. Um, inter incremental return to physical activity has to be medically cleared. They also need to make sure they rule out any serious issues. So if you have a student that starts having an increase in symptoms um, and you back them off of their activity and their symptoms aren't getting better, you need to send them back to the doctor's office. Um, so the doctor's office also here can support reduction of the school demands and home and social stimulation. So providing guidelines to the families on what are the right things to do. Um, the article that I'm, um, that much of this information came on out of the Journal of Pediatrics from November of 2012, really, uh, 13, pardon me, um, really talks a lot to the physicians about what, what are the right goals and roles to play in this department. Once the student gets back to school, it's the school's, it's the school's job to get them back into the learning environment. So again, no clearance is required to go back to school. Clearance is required to go back to play. Okay. All right. So what is return to learn? So that's the big question we have here. So return to play is something we hear a lot about. What does that look like? We'll talk about that in a second. But current recommendations include you need a graduated return to learn plan. So not a one approach. We've already talked about it. No one approach will work for everyone. It has to be tailored to that specific student and their specific issues. The other thing to be very aware of is that these two processes are not parallel. The student should always be back to full learning where they were before their injury before they return to the pl to play. So for example, if you have a student who was receiving um, special services at school, are they back to where they were before um, they sustained their injury? And were they participating in sports prior to their injury? And if the answers to those two things are yes, then if they're back to where they were before they had their injury and they're asymptomatic at rest and exertion, they can be in, in a return to play protocol. So they don't always go together. So we have a stepwise increase um, in cognitive activity, and um, it, it makes sense when you really think about it. So if they get symptoms with a cognitive task, it's too much too soon, you need to re 
to reduce it or you need to eliminate it for the time being. But if there are no symptoms, then it's okay to keep going. Honesty here is critical from all parties involved, in particular the student. Um, and return to learn protocols are gaining acceptance um, as key in the student's life, so getting them back to being a normal student. Um, again, it's challenging to find a one-size-fits-all, so you have to make sure that you tailor it to the student. Um, in the first one to three weeks, most interventions or adjustments can be made in the general education classroom. We're going to talk about that. Minimal, minimal support will be needed from this counselor, the psychologist, the social worker, or the athletic trainer or PE teacher. But it, it, if they are, they're there. The school nurse will be an integral piece of this as well, because especially at the elementary level. At the high school level, if it's a sport-related thing, it's probably going to be an athletic trainer if there's one on site. Again, the school nurse will play a role here in, in coordinating this activity. Parents should also be following up on a fairly regular basis just to make sure that adjustments are being made um, you know, weekly at minimum. And um, communication is really key. The other thing that, that really was highlighted um, by these two authors, Halstead and McAvoy, is, is it important for physicians to understand the educational terminology. So academic changes are the school's purview. So making adjustments are, goes to the responsibility of the school. But the physician can help. So they're going to need medical release um, or to, in order to return to play. Um, but this, the physician can help facilitate what might those changes need to be in the classroom. Okay, so um, medical release to go back to school isn't necessary, but return to play it is. Um, so academic terminology that we need to be aware of here is first one is academic adjustment, and that's referred to, um, that refers to changes made in those first one to three weeks that don't jeopardize the curriculum or require changes to standardized testing. So this is where 80 to 90 percent of all of our kids are going to fall. Um, if they surpass that one to three week time frame they may move into a place we call academic accommodation. And an accommodation refers to longer term needs that a student might need. Then it could include changes to standardized testing arrangements, class schedules, or more time for work. Um, when we get to the final step in this process, it's, we get to academic modifications. So we've gone from adjustment to accommodation to modification. This is a more long-term or permanent change. And if we get to accommodations or modifications, it may be time to look at a 504B or IEP, which we're going to get to yet today. It's important that the physician be involved case by case. Um, they can do it with a note each time, but it might simply be easier for somebody at the school, for example, the nurse or even the classroom teacher to communicate with the doctor's office um, in order to ensure that everybody's on the same page. Um, parent communication um, is key here as well. Um, to make sure that the student is really um, talking to their kid and understanding that they're getting what they need. So a plan uh, might look like this. Okay, so this is a return to learn plan. Um, and it's, um, we start with no activity, so this is complete cognitive rest, and the objective is recovery. Then we have a gradually reinducing, reintroducing cognitive activity. Um, and it's, it's important to make sure that these are low-key things that don't cause symptoms. Um, so they can do things for 5 to 10, 5 to 10 15 minutes. Um, and it's tailored to each student um, and what they need. So low-key social interactions are really good at this stage. Um, so they can have a friend come over. And depending on the age of the child, it can be drawing or playing with cars or Legos or baking with a family member. Those are things that don't require a lot of cognitive function. Um, but they're things the kid, the student can do or the child can do and feel like they're being uh, productive. Um, so what are some really basic things that they, can, um, that they can actually do without having to spend a lot of time with the screen or co concentrating? Um, so anything that doesn't require prolonged, sustained, whoops, apologize for that, sustained brain activity. Um, and that's, that's really important to, to be aware of. Um, avoiding reading early, um, and then computer games and video games will be important during this phase as well. So uh, the second stage is where they get homework at home before they go back to school. Um, can they do homework in 20 to 30 minute increments? So can they read for that you know, 15 to 20 minute time? Can they sit down and write or draw or do their math problems? So those are the kinds of things that they can do. So this increases their cognitive stamina 
and it lets them um, have short periods of cognitive activity followed by rest periods. Once they get to that point, again, that 30 to 45 minutes, they should be able to go back to school. So that can be part of a day, that can be the whole day, um, especially if they can do one to two hours cumulatively, not all at once, cumulatively of work at home. Um, so this would be adjustments, the adjustments period, so what things might we need to do different, what are the things that are causing them problems. So this might be an example of where if they're having trouble with light, um, you let them wear a hat or sunglasses. And I, I know from personal experience that youngsters don't always understand why somebody else gets to do something that they don't. So you might have to have hat day or hat week in your class if it's an elementary classroom. And I know that that kind of is one of the things that's really frowned upon. But if it, if it allows everybody to get on board to help Susie get better, then maybe it's the right thing to do. So that's, that's just one example. And then gradually you want to get them back to a full day of school. Your adjustments are going to decrease as their stamina improves. And then once they get back to a full workload, they should be back to testing on a normal basis. They should be caught up with all the things that are essential. You need to decide what's essential. So you don't want them to have to do everything. We'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, but um, this is when they can start their return to play protocol. And their return pro to play protocol simply means raising their heart rate and blood pressure for 20, 20 to 30 minutes of activity. And if for 24 hours they stay asymptomatic, they can go to the next step. No student should return to activity in less than five to six days. So most return to play protocols take a minimum of five to six days to go through. And then they can be back doing all the things that are normal for them as well. Um, are there any questions here? Yes, we actually have several questions and some kind of go back. Um, there is a follow-up question from the pupil reaction. Um, is looking at pupil reaction important if the student is alert and oriented? Or is the pupil reaction to light only uh, something valuable to assess if there is loss of consciousness? Or what's its value? Uh, the value of pupil reaction is critical, and loss of consciousness should not be the key to that. Um, loss of con um, the pupil pupil dilation can actually be a, a, um, a hint that there's something actually structurally going on in the brain. So um, if this is an initial evaluation of a student with unequal pupils and there's no documented history that the student has unequal pupils, that would be, that would be a trigger for me to refer that student immediately, so urgently or emergently, um, to the doctor's office. Um, because that unequal pupil dilation is a signal that there's something more going on that, that we can't see because, again, this is what's going on is not visible to the naked eye, so it's going on in the brain. So if they have unequal pupils, and so I'm going to make a leap that this is a nurse asking a question and it's happened on the playground. I may be wrong there, but um, if you see a student come in, even if they're alert and oriented, they have unequal pupils, you need to get it checked out. Okay. Next question. How do you handle parent resistance in taking the student to the doctor? <laughs> well, that's a $64,000 question. Um, most of the time, I didn't deal with that on a fairly regular basis because I was working with young adults, so they were making their own decisions. But um, I understand that that can happen. It can be mom doesn't believe, or parents don't believe that they have a problem, or um, they've cried wolf one too many times, or um, they simply can't afford to go to the doctor's office. Um, you may have to resort to, um, and, I, and I don't want to say it this way, but because it's going to come out wrong, but you may simply have to just be very blunt in the possible side effects of ignoring a concussion. Because um, Secondary, second impact syndrome is actually very real, and 50% um, of the patients that sustain second impact syndrome, so a second concussion after having one concussion, actually die. So um, it's pretty critical to get students checked out. Um, however, um, you know, based on my own personal training, I would be comfortable watching my own daughter, um, but it would, if her symptoms were strong enough, I would take her to the physician as well. So I wouldn't simply dismiss it out of hand either. So I, I know I haven't answered your question, and I haven't necessarily given you any good feedback. But the best thing I can do is run through the risks of a student that has a concussion being ignored and what can happen to them. Um, and I can 
provide resources to that individual on a couple of YouTube videos that will, will actually um, make your heart break if you watch them. Uh, one in particular of a student who personally ignored their own concussion um, and continued to um, participate in football. And he, tragically, um, he's, he's alive, but um, I'm not sure he would describe his life as a life anymore. Um, so that's the best I can offer. And it's about education. That's where all of this is going. It's, it's about educating on people, people on what they are. And the media has hit it so hard now that people are really dismissing it, and that's part of the problem as well, is that it's on a national consciousness level now. And people are saying, well, it, it worked for me. I got a bump to the head, and I, I'm fine. Well, you beat the odds, and that's important, and that's, that's great. But do you want to take that risk with your child becomes the question. So I'm not sure that I have really good information for you there, but um, that's the best I have to offer. Okay. Is there a law or regulation on the number of concussions a student can have before they are out of sports? No, there is not um, because it's such an individual um, scenario. Um, they are researching that all the time. So there are those who would say three, there are those who would say five, and there are those um, whose parents will say, you're not ever doing this again, and so it's one and done. Um, but the other thing that's important to note is that not every student sustains a concussion because of a sports-related sort of problem. And some kids are just unfortunate um, and happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So um, I've had season or career-ending injuries that happened on my campus that weren't even athletic related, slip and fall in the shower, slip and fall on the ice, uh, wrecked my bike, um, was in a car accident, you know, so those aren't even sport related, so it's really hard to quantify, um, you know, how many is too many. And um, I, I don't know that they were ever going to get there, so there's a lot of research going on right now in the number of concussions, the severity of concussion. We've gone away from grading concussions, so we don't grade them anymore. Um, you either have one or you don't. Um, they're not based on loss of consciousness. So it's all based on symptomology, and it's all very individual. I will tell you that the research indicates that the more concussions you have, the longer it will take you to get better from your previous um, this time than it did from your previous concussion. So what took you one week the first time might take you three weeks, the second time might take you six months the third time. Um, and so those are the kinds of scenarios that you'll deal with because your brain just needs more time to heal. So there isn't a standard on how many is too many today. Um, I'm not sure that that won't come out in the next two to five years, but there's no guarantee that's going to happen either. Okay, we have a few more questions. Um, are there certain medications to avoid while having a con concussion in regards to treating headache? Yes. So if the student has not been to the doctor um, and been told that they may take it, you should avoid any ibuprofen-based products. So if the student has been to the emergency room and the doctor has said it's okay for you to take ibuprofen, then it's okay. Um, until then, you should avoid ibuprofen and only take um, acetaminophen-based products. Um, Ibuprofen-based products that can actually um, cause increased bleeding response time. So anyone who's had elective surgery knows they've been told they're not supposed to take any ibuprofen-based products or aspirin-based products before two weeks before their surgery. Well, the reason they do that is because it makes you bleed more while you're having your procedure. So if you stick, stick with Tylenol or acetaminophen until you've been otherwise given instructions to take something different. So that's just a good rule of thumb to remember. Okay. Um, what do you suggest for a head bonk on the playground? For example, the student who hits a metal pole while running presents with no head injury symptoms initially. Do we pull him from PE and other recesses for the day until we assess increase of symptoms? Quite frankly, I would because adrenaline um, is a fantastic uh, body producer drug. Um, and usually after they've calmed down and their breathing comes back to normal and they've sat for a while is typically when their symptoms are going to come on. Um, give them an alternative, let them choose a friend to stay inside and play a game with, um, you know, a board game or something like that would be ideal. Um, so you would want to check them out initially if they have a bump on their head, which is pretty likely if they ran into a metal pole, you might want to put some ice on it for a short period of time. Um, 
and then um, see monitor their symptoms over the course of the rest of the day. Um, so the standard um, in most concussion legislation is if you suspect a concussion, so if I ran into a metal pole, I would suspect a concussion if I hit my head. Um, I would they, they need to be pulled for the remainder of the day. And then you can check them out the next day. So I would let mom and dad know this is what happened at the playground. Um, you need to watch for these things. So that would be a change in their symptoms and change in their personality, vomiting, nausea, um, headache that doesn't get better, they lose consciousness. So those are those kinds of things they want to look for, but they want to let them sleep and they want to see how they feel in the morning. And my mantra has always been another 12 hours isn't going to kill them and I should put that in quotations, and it's hard to do doing it this way, but it isn't going to hurt them to sit out for the rest of that day, and they're going to be fine the next day, then they, then they can return to everything like normal. So being cautious is in your best interest, in my opinion, um, because the concussion legislation really says if you suspect a concussion, they're done for the day, and then somebody needs to make a determination if it's okay for them to continue normally um, after that. So taking a look at them again the next morning when they come to school is a really good idea. So sit them out for the rest of the day, um, let them do something else so they don't feel like they're being punished. Um, so that's the biggest issue is that, that stigma, I'm being punished because this happened to me. Um, so that's important, but by the same token, you want to make sure that they're okay. Okay, and I'm going to hold the rest of the questions in the interest of time and perhaps either you can answer them at the end or um, respond by email. Is that okay? okay. That would be great. Thank right. you. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a very busy slide, and I will acknowledge it is busy, but it is taken from, again, the Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children. So this really is a, a, a form that can come to school from a doctor's office um, with suggested school adjustments, okay? Or it, it, it can actually come from the nurse at the school, for example. So um, the student has had a concussion. Um, what's appropriate for that student. So based on the symptom wheel, we talked about the physical, cognitive, emotional, and sleep problems. Um, what can you do? So um, strategic rest, give them 25, 15, 20 minutes during the day um, to rest, be in a quiet place. Let them wear their sunglasses. So it's sunglasses week in grade three, for example. Um, they need a quiet place to eat lunch because the lunchroom can be um, really loud. Um, lots of silverware, lots of kids whole bunch of stuff going on. They might just need a quiet place that's not full of stimulation. Um, so those are really easy examples of what they sh what you can do when they have physical symptoms. Emotional. So kids that get overwhelmed, what's the signal? Can they just leave the room? Um, they need to know if they're, they're having an issue and they've escalated in their symptoms or their emotional responses, they need a place to be able to go. And they need somebody to talk to. So again, this is where the nurse can play a role. Uh, uh, most schools will have a nurse that's, that's available at school on a regular basis. Um, a counselor at a high school might be an option as well. One of the big important things to think about emotionally is you need to look for secondary symptoms of depression and anxiety because they get isolated socially, uh, and that can be a really big problem for some students. And really, really good students don't really like this returning to the classroom business because they feel like they're getting behind. So it, it's really important to take into consideration who your students are as well. Um, cognitively, so what can you do? So reducing their workload in the classroom, no non-essential work. So at the top it says work removed, consider removing 25% of it requiring 25% of it, and the rest is negotiable. So make it adjustable through the day um, rather than um, see how they are progressing. And this should actually, they should have more work required as you go through that one to three week time frame. Um, so the other problem is, is that if they get a symptom, so say their headache comes on, what is it what they were doing? So um, what activity spurred that? Um, symptom to come on and can you avoid that or can you change the assignment so those are the kinds of things so this is where logging the activities becomes really important so you know what triggered the problem so don't be afraid to let them take a break um, during the day and and make sure you have secured a, a me mechanism to allow that happen um, anything that requires quick eye movements might need to be changed for students who have trouble with that sort of problem and this is where headache can become the predominant symptom we've talked about bright lights and exposure to light and ways that you can mitigate that um, sound can be a really big problem for students again a crowded hallway um, shop class um, music class um, even go into 
um, assemb an assembly or a concert or a basketball game might be a problem. So these are things that um, you might have to make adjustments for. So this is a really um, good piece of information, and this is available off of the Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children website. This is actually out of the uh, manual from REAP, um, and this divides it out by team. So the family team is orange, that's their responsibility in the first three weeks. The school team, physical team, three weeks responsibility. The academic team, what can be done, and then the medical team. And again, symptoms are a part of this. So, and it's normal to have those for about three weeks. When they get longer than that, then, then we have a problem. But this really outlines it quite nicely as to who has what responsibility during this time frame. And they've thrown the athletic trainer in here on the school physical team as well. Um, if you have an athletic trainer, for example, at your high school, they can be a pretty good ally in this particular environment. So don't be afraid to, um, don't be afraid to utilize them. And in the interest of time, I'm going to move forward to the last section. So these are the special circumstances. These are the kids who don't really necessarily get better. So response to intervention is something that um, anyone in education, especially elementary and secondary education, is familiar with. So um, response to intervention came out of the 2004 Reauthorization of Individuals with Disability Act, or IDEA. And this says that good teaching and reasonable academic adjustments in the general education classroom supports 80 to 90 percent of students with mild or temporary problems. This falls, concussions fall here. Okay, so this is return to learn. That's what I just outlined. So if everyone's honest, communicates openly, and cooperates, most students will be back in one to three weeks. Now, for the student who's not back in one to three weeks, where do you go with them? Okay, so that's where a 504B plan comes in. So this is a targeted intervention. And this is available for a child who needs a longer term academic accommodation in a regular classroom, but doesn't qualify for special education, so they don't need an IEP. Um, the doctor can facilitate this process by providing medical documentation based on the symptoms that are persisting um, that may limit the child's ability for instruction. The documentation done by the school's academic team is critical here, related to the child's um, progress to the initial adjustments that were made in allowing them to get back into the classroom. Um, and you still need to keep the ki this child out of physical play at this point in time. So the doctor needs to understand that the child has got to be fully participating in academics where they were prior to the concussion before they return them to extracurricular activities. So a 504B plan can be something that um, it's too much for the regular classroom teacher to handle. They need a little extra assistance in this one area. So 504B might be the way to ad accommodate that for the remainder of a school year, for example. So a shorter period of time um, than in, in you know, permanent classification, but it allows them to complete um, their, their year of school. The last stage is the individual education plan. Very few students with a concussion Again, not motor vehicle trauma accident or other high risk trauma accident um, are are going to not get here, but those cases do exist. So um, this is required when changes to curriculum placement or instruction are needed. So this is where return to um, the interventions that we started with um, come into play. So documentation must occur throughout the process because it sets the foundation for the IEP. If the symptoms remain severe or prolonged for five or six months, again, it can't be accommodated in a regular classroom by a regular teacher, um, then this is where an IEP may come in. And this is where permanent disability may have to be considered. So this triggers the child find, which is a component of IDEA, um, the child find obligation, providing appropriate testing and development of an IEP. So documentation is critical, and this is a really rare situation for a student with a concussion. Um, again, a, a regular sports-related, playground-related sort of concussion. Most of these students, are, again, are going to get better within one to three weeks, 80 to 90 percent. So that's the vast majority of students that have this problem. Um, so you need to be prepared for the fact that we could get to an IEP, um, but it, it's not the norm but that's the process which, which occurs. So the other thing that I've provided here is um, the two links to the CDC's uh, fact sheet for school professionals and then the REAP guidelines booklet. And to get the REAP guidelines booklet, you have to create this account with um, this company called, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, in order to download it, but I have provided that to you. Maggie sent that out um, as an um, 
attachment, I believe it was either last night or this morning. So I apologize for going really quickly through the end of that, um, and I know that um, we are out of time, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has in whatever time we do have left, or I would be happy to communicate via email for those who have questions. Again, I'm not, um, this, this is an interest level for me. It's a passion that I have. I hope that that came out of my voice today. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but what I found I think is really good stuff um, that will help anybody who's trying to work students back into the classroom after concussion. So with that, Maggie, I'll take any more questions that you might have. Okay. Um, and just to let people know, if you did not receive the link to where the website where the um, those handouts are at, I did enter a link into the chat box. Um, that should be in your um, toolbar. So, um, okay, so the questions. Team approach is desirable, but what are options for team members when rural districts lack nurses, counselors, and psychs on contract at only at school maybe one day a week? Well, that, that does... Um that does complicate the situation. So um, when you are in face with that particular situation, do you have a team approach where there are more than one teacher that works together, or this may be where the principal um, on site gets involved? Um, it may be a situation where um, I don't know how resources can be allocated, but is there a way to allow the nurse to come you know, for half a day um, if you have a series of students or a student that, that needs that sort of intervention, um, they can still, um, because of our advent of technology, she sh they still should be able to communicate fairly regularly um, with the student. But um, you know, if in the particular situation you've outlined, if a student gets sick in that rural district, what happens with that student? Who would who would be the one that calls mom and takes care of the student until they come to pick them up? Um, so. That, that one's a difficult one for me um, and because I, I don't work in that environment on a regular basis. Um, and so I think being creative and thinking a little bit out of the box about ways to help accommodate the student and get them um, the assistance that they need throughout the course of the day without overburdening the classroom teacher, because I think that's what really happens here, is the classroom teacher is the one that's going to take the brunt of it, and they're going to need a little additional support. And so who can that person be? Um, is, there a, is there an aid? that's available, um, for example, that, that floats, or maybe it's the, resor um, the, the recess supervisor, or the librarian, or the person that functions as a librarian, or um, I, I'm, try I'm just trying to think of my, my daughter's school, for example, um, who might be that person that could step in and uh, provide a little extra assistance. Um, and I know they have a number of different aides that are in the school during the course of the day, and many of those are one-on-ones, and I understand that that can't change, but um, is there somebody that's a floater that can help? Or um, So those are scenarios that um, you would have to work with your, within your districts to um, try to figure out how to accommodate situations that come up like that. But um, being creative is probably the best bet in that regard. Okay. Are the academic team members educated on TDI symptoms and return to school adjustments? Well, hopefully, um, but again, the resources that I've provided really are an excellent education um, synopsis for students or for people who would be put in this situation and really outline um, really outline re good things for you to be aware of. Um, again, this is where knowing the students becomes the biggest piece of the puzzle, and I know that early in the year, or if you're new to the district, that isn't always um, possible, but there may be the previous year's teacher that's still there that can help you with that process. But education becomes the biggest tool in your arsenal in this particular situation, and I really, it's hard for me to, to convey how really valuable, um, especially the REAPs, the REAP benefit of good concussion management tool is. It's a really bright, colorful, 20-some page document that really outlines whose role is what, what, what we need to be looking for, um, in addition to providing um, a symptom checklist chart that you can help a student fill out um, over the course of every day that they come in just to see where they're at and um, what to do. I have lots of other documents I'm happy to share um, that are public access 
resources that um, would be helpful for education. But you know, the symptomology that I outlined, quite frankly, is pretty basic and what you're going to come across just about wherever you go. So if you can be familiarize yourself with the fact that there are some pretty standard symptoms that come with concussion and then there are some pretty pretty weird ones like my colorblindness situation that I gave you, but um, most of them fall into a pretty um, routine category and you can kind of peg who has what just by taking a look at them once you get to know them. Um, and even if you don't know the student really well, you can tell when they don't feel good. Um, so that that can be a clue. So if you trust your instincts in that regard, that can be helpful as well. Okay, there is one question um, if you're able to share your PowerPoint or um, if that is unavailable. Um, I, I can get that out to you yet later today. Okay. Maggie, if that would be okay. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, and then uh, there are probably about 10 or so questions. I don't know if you want to try and push through those um, or if you want to try and respond by email or... I have I have about 15 more minutes if okay. that works for the people who are still on the webinar. Yep, I just did a look and it looks like some of those people are still on. So, um, can a school implement an education plan for each student post-concussion without a doctor's order? Yes. So the doctor doesn't need to be part of the return to learn process. Um, so the school really, again, it's the school's purview to get them back to normal academic. They don't need clearance to come back to, to school necessarily or even to return to learning. They have to have clearance to return to play. So that's the, the, biggest, the biggest difference. Okay, next question. What to do with a student that is five months post-injury with daily headaches still? Oh, well, this is a student who probably, if they're not under the doctor's care, they need to be under the doctor's care because there may be some underlying problems. So if a student isn't getting better in that one to three or we've reached that five-month period of time, it's time for more answers and it's probably time for more testing. Now, if that has happened and there aren't answers, which quite frankly could be the case, um, learning to manage what causes those symptoms. So this student probably needs to be um, educated on keeping a, a symptoms checklist and triggers journal basically. So my headache started at this time of day, this is what I was doing and can we find a correlation to what's causing the headache based on what the student's doing. So that's one of the things that can be very valuable. The other thing is that this student probably needs um, to perhaps be transitioned into that 504B situation where um, if it's outside of what can be handled in the regular classroom, they probably need additional accommodations um, in order to facilitate their learning. And it, is it that just one thing causes their daily headache? So is it because they're going to recess or is it because they um, uh, math is causing it, you know, so that becomes, so that's where, again where the daily, the daily journal of when, my, what time did the symptoms come on, what were their severity, and what, what was I doing right around the time that that happened can be really valuable in trying to isolate what it is the issue. And that can actually help the physician as well, try to figure out what might be going on too. Um, so journaling that and having a trigger a triggers symptoms journal and sharing it with the doctor, but doing that for a good week, and you, you're probably going to see some patterns that show up. So that would be my advice to start with, is trying to figure out what it's, what's causing it. Okay, we have so doctors. that's helpful. Okay. Uh, we have doctor's orders that essentially say return to school, but no tests, quizzes, computer, reading, etc. So we think, what can they do? Um, from what you're saying, <laughs> maybe the doctor shouldn't be the specific or the student isn't ready to return to school. Please comment. Well, quite frankly, um, if they're not supposed to do any of those things, then I'm not sure why they would be at school. So perhaps they need to be at home for a few more days so their symptoms can calm back down. But the other thing would be, um, you know, are there, what, what's the grade level the student becomes the question. So what are some things that can be done um, that, um, so if the student can't read, and I know most districts probably don't have access to this, but are there, is there a way to read to the student? So is the textbook that you're using available um, on, on tape for, 
that's the wrong way to say that, but is it available in a digital version where it can be read to the student? So that's that's one option. Um, not a great option because it's really person intensive, um, but that might be a way to um, involve the student in what's going on where they can actually maybe hear what the other students are getting and then answer questions. So that's, that's an option. Um, you know, one of the options that was given in the on one of the slides that I showed was um, instead of writing, can they do a collage? So can they cut pictures out of a magazine and um, to 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 convey their ideas? You know, so those are those are options. So again, this becomes about create being creative. But if they're if they really can't do any of those sorts of things, so I can understand tests and quizzes. Um, but if if they can't handle you know, 30 to 45 minutes of some sort of focused activity, they probably aren't ready to be back at school yet. And so that has to be the question that needs to be asked. Um, and uh, this, this reference that I've provided is, is a great one for physicians as well, as well because it really talks to physicians as well as the, the article in, um, from November of 2013 from the Pediatrics by Halstead and McAvoy. I would highly recommend physicians read it and educate themselves. Um, so concussions have really come on hard in the last few years and, and I can say from a clinician's point of view returning kids back to school that that has been a source of frustration for me is that um, you know there's, there's a lot of information out there that's old that needs to be um, updated from um, and made available to people and the time to, to look at it, quite frankly. So that would be my thought is either the student isn't ready because they can't do 30 to 45 minutes of activity or be even more creative with how you get them the information. I hope that helped. Okay. Um, somebody wants to know about the balance test. Can you explain that a little uh, bit? So I can. I can. Um, we use a BEST test, is this the, net, the gold standard. So the BEST test is a balanced air scoring test. And um, it's done in um, three positions and two surfaces. So there's six different stances that the student or the person would participate in. Um, if you want to do the, the full BEST test, it's pretty simple to do and you can actually access it probably online fairly, fairly easily. But um, a very quick way to do a balance test would simply be to do a field sobriety test. So can they walk a line? Can they stand um, with their feet down and their arms out to the side, close their eyes and touch their nose? Those are really easy ways to do that. But if you want a quantifiable test, you can use the best test. And it's um, standing um, two feet, eyes closed, hands at the side for 20 seconds, and you're monitoring for um, errors. So you're looking for, did they lose their balance? Um, did they open their eyes? Um, did they fall over? Um, there's, a, there's a number of different, and I can provide that. I have, a, I have the standardized version of that, and I could share that for you to post. Um, and then the second stance is um, single leg, so standing on a leg. And the third stance is standing in tandem, so um, toe, um, heel to toe. And then you do those three stances over again on an unstable surface. And again, you're counting errors in a 20-second period. So it takes approximately three minutes um, total to do that test, going from um, one stance to the other stance. Um, but if you don't have a baseline, it's not very helpful um, without a baseline. So you need to do it when they're normal. Um, and then you can do the balance or air testing after they've sustained a concussion as well. So if that particular individual that asked that question is interested in that um, testing, I can send it their way. Okay. So, uh, there was a follow-up to a question to one of them, uh, one of the answers that you had. I'm confused by your statement that students do not need clearance to return to academics at school. In my area, the rehab physician and neuropsychologist do make recommendations about when the when and how much academic work can be done at any one time and whether this should be done on homebound or the classroom. Okay, so um, those are recommendations. So, um, and, and so again, what I'm putting together is a synopsis of materials that are out there. So legally, there's no requirement for a physician to clear a student to go back to work, to school. 
legally in every state in the country, there's a requirement for the student to be cleared to go back to athletic activity. So if you have a physician that's providing you with guidance on what they can do and when they can do it, I think that's actually fantastic, especially if they're a psychologist and a rehab physician, because they probably really know what they're doing. So that I think that's valuable. Um, so that, that advice is probably um, really important. But the other thing is, is that the teachers at the school are going to be in the trenches every day. So you're going to see how the student is progressing. So are they getting better? And if they're getting better, are they ready for more cognitive exertion? So if the physician saw the student on Monday and by Friday they're feeling really good and they, they really feel like they can do more, you're in the best place to see what their progression has looked like. So do they need to be as restricted as they were on Monday, on Friday? So you have the the benefit of watching them get progressively better. So I think I think having the guidance, the recommendations from that that physician set that you described, Maggie, is really critical and very helpful as as a place to start. So um, legally, um, they don't have to provide that clearance, whereas having it is a bonus. I think it's a really positive bonus. So I would go with it, quite frankly. And then you may be able to progress them based on the student. Um, unless they're seeing the doctor every day, but that's the problem. You see them every day, the doctor doesn't see them every day. So I hope that kind of clarified that question and made it less confusing. Okay, and someone just, I don't know if everyone can see the um, questions asked, but somebody wanted to remind folks that all AEAs should in Iowa have the brain injury resource teams. Um, and Howard, it's five o'clock. Do you need to go, Leslie? Um, if you have one more, I can do one more. There are a couple questions. Um, do you have comments about second impact syndrome? Um, second impact syndrome is really scary, and I don't want to ever have to worry about it. So my mantra has always been, they can live to hate me another day as an athletic trainer. So if that means taking them out and they're mad at me, and they're mad at me for the rest of their life, I hope it's a long and healthy hate. I, I know it's right, but it's what I feel. So. Um, there's no reason for a student to ever suffer from second impact syndrome if you know they've had a concussion and they've been honest with you. So it's, it's really important. Now, um, that's within your control. So the kid that has a concussion and gets in a car accident, we can't control that. Um, so those things can happen. But if everybody's being honest with everyone in this whole process and we've, it's, it's real, there's no reason a student should ever suffer from second impact syndrome. Um, and, Part of the problem that we deal with occasionally is, as in the scenario as I teach young athletic trainers, is the little boy who cried wolf is real. And when you have a little boy that cried wolf, you get really tired of dealing with their problems that aren't problems until they really have a problem. And then you have a hard time figuring out what's real. So you always have to treat them like their situation is valid every time they come to you. Because you never know when that you never know when that situation is going to come forward. So second impact syndrome is not something I ever want to have to deal with as a clinician. Um, so I always err on the side of caution um, when taking students out when it comes to athletics because um, their life is not worth one more play, one more game. Um, and many will tell you, and the example that I show my students every year is, um, is a young man named Preston Pleverides. Um, he sustained a second impact injury. and. Um, he will tell you today in his advocacy work that he, if he'd have known the consequences of his behaviors, he would have waited one more game. And I think that's pretty telling. So that's, that's kind of where I fall on that one. Okay. And then um, just a, probably a quick one for you. Does uh, Central implement return to learn um, for athletes? Is it trainer or coach initiated or student initiated? Well, because of FERPA and our students being 18, um, we've been working through this process for the last couple of years, and it's actually a combination process um, where the athletic trainer tends to be the lead person on it simply because they're associated with it. And then in my capacity as class dean, um, our, I have three counterparts, so there's four of us. We work with the athletic training staff and the students. The students are ultimately the ones that have to contact their faculty members, but we have the ability to, to assist them in that process, and we do work with them to get them back into the classroom. Um, they have to know their own, their own limitations, though, um, and we, we try to work them through the process of how to alternate classes and which classes to go to and, and um, letting their faculty members know their problems are actually real. Um, 
they're not going to get out of their work, they don't want out of their work, they simply may need more time, um, they may more time to take a test, they may need more time to write a paper. Um, so those are instances where we do intervene and um, we do help students through the process of getting back into the classroom because ultimately that's what they're here for, is to get an education and, and we do want to facilitate that. And again, 80 to 90 percent of our students, probably closer to 90 percent of our students get back to the classroom within a very short period of time without any trouble. Um, but we do have the occasional student with lingering problems and it's usually isolated to one area and so we simply work with them on that. Um, and it, it can be challenging and we also have a student support services office that assists in that as well, So, um, which is a federal, pro a federal program. And so we do have the access to some sorts of, they're not special education processes, but we do have access to some of those kinds of services for our students if they're, if they're in need of them. So that's how we try to do it here. Okay. Well, um, there are a few more questions on the table, but I think I'll work with you to get those answered offline out of uh, the interest of we are quite a bit of time over. But I do appreciate we still have quite a few people on, on the call. So um, thank you for all of you that were able to stay on to get the additional information. Um, when you close your webinar, um, you will, should get the, the evaluation, so if you could complete that, then I will send you a certificate of attendance. Um, that probably won't come until tomorrow, so I'll just let you know. And then I've been asked um, to supply a couple of other pieces of information, and so I will send those out to attendees as well. So um, if you have any additional questions for us, feel free to use the registration email that you received to respond to, um, and I'll try and answer your questions if I can. So thank you all for attending today, and thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Maggie. Okay. Goodbye. Bye.